Who's your commander? Good luck. Equip? Move to combat. Resolves. Okay. Now, before you attack Does me. anyone have an answer? Well played. Good game. Hello, Merfolk aficionados. My name is Jumbo Commander, and I have a brand new deck tech focusing on Merfolk. This was inspired by the Merfolk vs. Goblins dual deck. I made the Goblins video last week. It was awesome. You can go ahead and check it out. But this week, I'm talking about Merfolk. Now, it's not just the dual deck that inspired this. I've been really, really interested in the Merfolk since Ixalan came out, and that's because they had a ton of great green Merfolk, mixing up the color pie, giving some more options to Merfolk. And we know that there's only more good stuff to come because Mark Rosewater all but guaranteed a Merfolk Lord in the next set. That means Merfolk is going to be supported, and so I'm really excited to see even more cards fitting a budget and fitting into this deck. So this is kind of a classic Merfolk deck. But what is classic Merfolk? Well, I think it's defined mostly by the modern deck, and the reason why the modern deck is so successful is because of the lords. All of those two drop lords, the blue blue lords that pump your team, give them island walk. I mean, it's just a really powerful ability. A lot of the time lords are going to be three mana. And so getting in under that threshold is going to be really powerful. Two mana lords are so strong because the modern merfolk deck has an aggro plan. You're going to get your creatures onto the battlefield fast through ether vials and just casting them and then build up this great merfolk synergy. And along with it, there's a lot of disruption, the spreading seas, changing your opponent's lands into islands, and giving your merfolk access to island walk into your opponent's face. And so these three come together to make the merfolk deck really kind of fun to play. But how does that translate to a commander deck? What commander will I be using? Well, I've decided to use Derevi Imperial Tactician a non-Merfolk commander for my Merfolk deck. I know I feel a little bit ashamed, but honestly, it's the color combination that we really need. There are a lot of really great green Merfolk just out of Ixalan, and I know there's gonna be even more in the coming set. Blue is gonna be the predominant color of this deck, and so we need blue. And the white is important for all of the cool old Merfolk from Lorwyn Block. So I needed this color combination, and honestly, Derevi does have some synergies with the tapping and untapping ability on it. I will also be sharing with you a non-budget commander that fits the theme a little bit better, but I'm going to share that at the end of the video. For now, I'm going to focus on Derevi because inexpensive, the right colors, and part of the tapping to untapping synergy that makes Drevi just a really solid leader, even though he's sadly not a merfolk. But let's talk about one of the most compelling reasons to play merfolk, and that's the synergies in all of the lords. And these lords, Lord of Atlantis, Master of the Pearl Trident, Merfolk Sovereign, Marrow Reedry, and Coral Helm Commander will eventually become a lord once you sink six mana into him. Now, these lords can be very powerful, we've seen it in modern, but they're powerful because of the speed at which you're able to deploy them. We don't have multiple copies, we're kind of limited to the number of lords we have, and honestly it doesn't matter much if we're playing them on turn 2 versus turn 3 versus turn 10. And we are not putting a lot of money into this mana base, so we're not going to be able to reliably have blue blue on turn two and then also be able to play a lot of our other spells. So we're seeing these lords have a lot less value in this deck versus a more aggressive modern deck, but they're still powerful and they're still lords and we're still going to see a lot of synergy. Let's go on to some other synergy with Vanquisher's Banner. This is a awesome card that pumps your team, but more importantly, when you cast a merfolk, you get to draw a card. Now that's going to be really important. In a lot of aggro decks, we need to make sure to maintain our forward momentum and keep drawing cards. Let's mention a few more lords, Adaptive Automaton and Metallic Mimic. These are not budget. I'm actually kind of disappointed these guys didn't find their way into the most recent commander pre-constructed tribal decks. 
And if you feel like you don't have enough Anthem effects, this is definitely a category that you have a lot of customization in. You could add a Beastmaster's Ascension or a Mirari's Wake. You could add a lot of different Anthems because these colors are really versatile. But let's focus on the plan of attack, and that's gotta be aggro. And the first thing I have to point out is this is the token, the elemental token that comes with the Merfolk versus Goblins dual deck. Is it not amazing and majestic? Look at that. Ah, okay, let's move on. At its heart, Merfolk is an aggro deck, so you're going to need to flood the board with creatures, pump them up, and get in for damage. That's why I think the new Tempest Caller is going to be really strong. Tapping down an opponent's creatures is going to be exactly what you need to close out the game. You know, Merfolk are a little bit puny, so Mirror Entity pumping them all up with a huge base power and toughness is very strong. A Deep Channel Mentor is a little bit expensive at 6 CMC, but blue creatures you control are unblockable. That's pretty good, and it's a merfolk itself. You do have some non-blue creatures in here, but the majority of your deck is going to be leaning blue. We've seen the power of Master of Waves pumping out elementals, and you can use little crabbies for your elementals, that's nice. But Deep Root Waters is going to be the real MVP in this deck, giving you merfolk after merfolk after merfolk. Wait, and the creature token has hexproof? That's kind of cool. I'm liking that a lot. And there's one more card that pumps out little merfolks for you, and that's Lul Mage Mentor. This gives you a little blue merfolk whenever you counter a spell or ability. Now, that could be tough. I'm not running a lot of counter spells in this deck, but it has another ability. Tap seven untapped merfolk you control and counter target spell. Now that's pretty cool. I like that. And it, even though it's hard to have seven merfolk on the battlefield, the threat of countering with the little mage mentor really changes the dynamic of the game. And Wake Thrasher, the final card in this aggro category, is very strong because it can just get huge. And if you can get Wake Thrasher some sort of evasion, you can easily knock someone out of the game. Now, these both kind of transition us into other categories as well. Both of them deal with tapping and untapping, and Lul Mage Mentor is an excellent piece of disruption. And that's the third important part of the modern Merfolk deck, is disruption. Merfolk try to keep your opponents off balance, and the most commonly used tool for this is Spreading Seas. That land you needed for mana is now an island, and I get to draw a card. I have not included Spreading Seas because it costs two bucks, and honestly, it doesn't fulfill the disruption category in EDH like it does in Modern. I kept in Aquitex... Aquitex? Aquitex, Will. That can't be a... that's... is that a real word? Okay, I looked it up, googled it. No, I don't think it's a real word, <laughs> but it sounds cool. Good job, Wizards, for coming up with something that sounds like. Okay, that came included in the dual deck, so I kept it in the EDH deck, but honestly, it doesn't do very much. If you do want to go with this sort of disruptive mess with their lands theme, you could try Quicksilver Fountain. Quicksilver Fountain is a hilarious card that will slowly turn every land on the battlefield into islands, and once everything is an island, poof, they all go back to normal again. So sometimes your opponents stop playing lands in order to make the Quicksilver Fountain go away. And by the way, if the Quicksilver Fountain leaves the battlefield, they stay islands. There's nothing, the flood counters don't go away. It's really great. Uh, if you want to kind of loop this scenario and never run out of islands, you could use a Boro Palace in the clouds. And basically it has an activated ability that returns it to your hand. So you can like place the counter on and then in response, return it to your hand and then play it again and then place the counter on it again. It's pretty cool. Uh, you might find a Boro Palace in the Clouds, number one, expensive, and number two, familiar, because Merfolk deck play it, ah, so they don't get choked out or other hated out uh, in modern Merfolk. Pretty cool. Um, it also means that it's kind of a useless land, except for weird quarter case stuff, but it's still expensive. Ah, I don't understand. Um, but 
By the way, as long as we're just turning all of our opponent's lands into islands, let's throw in a carpet of flowers and like double up our mana. Oh my gosh, that would be so great. I'm a big fan of carpet of flowers in general, but it's not sticking to the budget, so I'm not throwing it in. If we really also want to double down on the disruptive elements, Wave of Vitriol can be really strong in this deck. We don't have very many artifacts. We don't have very many enchantments. Uh, we do have a little bit of a tricky mana base with the three colors, but we have plenty of basics in this budget deck. And so we can Wave of Vitriol everyone to death and then be totally fine with all of our basics. But let's think of other ways to disrupt the opponent. And one of my favorites has to be Root Water Thief. This little merfolk is adorable. You can give him flying, and when he punches your opponent in the face, you can pay two, and then exile a card from their library. You just go searching and just take out the card you don't want them to have anymore. People hate Root Water Thief. They hate it. And it's honestly a really fun ability to use, and it's nice every so often to be able to neuter an opponent's combo deck just with your stupid little merfolk. But honestly, we don't have a lot of disruption because we're focused so heavily on this aggro strategy. And honestly, we need to prevent our opponent's disruption more than we need to disrupt them. So that's why I think cards like Heroic Intervention, Teferi's Protection, and Ghost Away are going to be really important to this deck. The problem is that none of these are really good budget cards. Heroic Intervention is the cheapest. It's sitting at like three bucks. Man, it's just a little bit much, but maybe it's what we can do. Teferi's Protection and Ghost Away are just a little bit too far out of our price range to really make this budget, but this is a weakness of the deck. So if you don't have these cards to shore up that weakness, you can at least know that that's a weakness. Maybe you can build in some other form of recursion as you sort of customize and tinker this deck. There's another thing to prevent disruption, and that's Sig River Guide and Kopala Warden of Waves. This is protection from spot removal. Sig gives target merfolk you control protection of from the color of your choice until end of turn. Very powerful for getting in damage and protecting. Kopala does kind of a blanket protection, but it only makes them pay two more. Mm. EDH is a game of big mana. I'm pretty sure that they're going to be annoyed to pay two extra to kill your creature, but they're just going to do it. Now, the modern deck focused on Lords, Aggro, and Disruption. We're going to need a little bit more depth to our EDH deck, so I want to talk a little bit about Tap Synergies. And a lot of these come out of the original Lorewyn tribe of Merfolk, and they're really cool, and so I wanted to embrace some of these strategies. And honestly, Derevi is a perfect example of this. You have an aggro deck where a lot of creatures are getting in, and then you can tap and untap target permanence, generating extra mana, doing some crazy stuff, especially if we have cards like Veteran of the Depths getting plus one plus one counters, Stony Brook Schoolmaster is getting creatures, Surge Spanner bouncing permanence, Judge of Currents gaining life, or Fallow Sage drawing cards. And it doesn't just have to be those specific creatures. We can have our creatures turn into mana dorks with Cryptolith Right, or if you have tons of money, Earthcraft. You can also tap your creatures to crew vehicles or summon the school. Three and a white for a tribal sorcery. I really hope that tribal sorceries come back one day. Put two 1-1 one, one blue merfolk wizard creature tokens into play, and then tap four untapped merfolk you control. Return summon the school from your graveyard to your hand. We can also dominate the board with other tap effects using opposition or glare of subduel. And if we just need to get some tapping done, Survivor's Encampment and Holdout Settlement, let us tap our creatures, maybe draw a card, put a plus one plus one counter on something, but also fix our mana, which could be a little bit dicey. The current build of this deck leans heavily into blue. About 75% of the pips are blue. And so all of the duels are blue and another color. For example, I'm not running a Slesnia Sanctuary because I honestly don't need green and white mana. I need blue mana that splashes for my two other colors. Next up, I'd like to briefly mention some reach, mostly in the form of card draw. Now, aggro decks need a lot of momentum. We need the card draw because our 
cards in the late game aren't as impactful, so we need more draw to keep us going and to flood the board. Cold-Eyed Selkie, Merfolk Branchwalker, Shapers of Nature, Prime Speaker Zagana, and Sage of Fables all have some interesting card draw. Actually, now that I look at it, a lot of these have interesting plus one plus one counter synergies as well. So if you want to embrace something like Varela the Hulkclade and go with a little bit more of a plus one plus one counter synergy, that could work. The Branch Walker and the Shaper that I mentioned could go in this strategy really well, but also Kosi's Trickster. A one mana one one, but whenever an opponent shuffles his or her library, put a plus one plus one counter on Kosi Trickster. Ooh, that could get really big depending on your meta. I'm actually curious to see how big this Merfolk could get. And of course, Herald of Secret Streams, giving all of your plus one, plus one countered Merfolk unblockable. That will definitely get some damage through. Continuing on with the card draw, Biden of Thassa is going to be really valuable. And even though he's not a Merfolk, Edric Spymaster of Trest is going to both embrace the aggro strategy, but also support the card draw that we need in this deck. And I know I'm trying to keep this on a budget, but I've decided to include one Planeswalker because it's so inexpensive right now, just over $4 and so awesome, Tamiyo Field Researcher. One green, white, blue for a four loyalty Planeswalker, and you can tick it up to choose two target creatures and until your next turn, whenever they deal damage, you draw a card. So this is card draw that's recurrable over and over again. It can also tap down creatures so that you can maybe get some damage through. And the ultimate, like most Planeswalker Ultimates, is unreachable but insane. Now I want to talk about a few upgrades that you could have to this deck. My ideal commander would not be Derevi, although the synergies are undeniable. I think what I'd have to go with is Thrasios, Triton Hero, and Ravos Soul Tender as partner commanders. And the reason why is because I feel like we need a merfolk at the helm, but then Ravos adds the right colors. In fact, it adds a whole nother color, black. It also is an anthem and a recursion engine. Now remember, we want anthems in this deck, and we also want the ability to gain card draw because this strategy is so frail. Adding black is also a really big boon to this deck. Just being able to add Sig River Cutthroat to make sure that you have both Sigs in the deck, that just feels right. Hollow Sage is another good card, and Ink Fathom Witch, another great merfolk that you could definitely include in this deck if you had the ability to add black. Just the expense of these cards. They're just a little bit expensive, but partner commanders are really cool. This is also gonna mess up the mana base even more when you add black. But here's the great thing. Let's say you're interested in playing Merfolk. You start out with Duretti, you buy the Goblins versus Merfolk dual deck, and you're in for the whole thing, including sleeves, 75 bucks. That's a really inexpensive commander deck, and you got some goblin cards to trade away, maybe make up some of that money. Okay, so that's a really low investment, and you decide you love merfolk. Well, you can easily start upgrading, throw a Thrasios in your deck, begin small improvements on the mana base, and then bam, partner up with Ravos, and then now you have a more complicated and advanced merfolk deck. I'm just really happy about the reprints in this dual deck because so many of the key pieces of a merfolk are so inexpensive right now. All right, everyone, that has been my budget merfolk introduction. There's so many great merfolk out there. Do some searches, find out what your favorite merfolk are because they really are an awesome tribe. I'd like to thank my patrons who make this content possible. Thank you, thank you to everyone. And also, I'd like to wish you guys a great holiday. This is gonna come out right before Christmas. And so if you're celebrating Christmas, I hope you have a wonderful one. My name is Jumbo Commander and I'm all over the place. I wanna wish you a happy holiday and happy deck building. I'll talk to you guys real soon, bye.